We're delighted to welcome you to join us for a look ahead. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons designed by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is the final lesson in the series entitled, Glimpses of Our God. And this lesson is entitled, The Promise of His Return, and it's for those who will be studying it on March 31, 2012. We'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we begin with a word of prayer. Our kind, wonderful Father, we now think about the time when you will return. What a precious promise it has always been to Adventists. No wonder we use that as part of our name. We ask now that you will guide us in this study, show us the way, show us what you want us to know as we consider these issues as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you could guess, this lesson focuses on the second coming of Jesus Christ. Adventists, we're so focused on the second coming, now remember this is not Seventh-day Adventists, these are Adventists before there was a Seventh-day Adventist church, but Adventists, people who believed in the second coming, believing that it was imminent, were so focused on the second coming of Christ in our early history that it was made a part of our name. So what is God waiting for? What do we need to do to get ready? Are you waiting for something to happen before you get serious about His coming? How soon do you think He might actually return? Is God waiting for the world to become more sinful? I, you've probably all heard these kind of questions in one form or another in Sabbath school classes or in church and so forth. Let's see if we can try to address ourselves to some of these questions. What if Jesus came today? How many people would be totally shocked? Well, what do you mean by coming? I mean the imminent second coming of Jesus Christ. You mean like in the clouds of heaven. Right now, somebody's yeah. working and all of a sudden, boom, they come? You look up and there he is. Is, is that part of the, the plot that's going to happen? No, I don't think it's going to happen that way, but it will be that way for some, for a lot of people. That's what's implied by Matthew 24, where it talks about one person's going to be taken from bed and another one left, and someone's going to be taken from the mill and the, the grindstone, and another one is not, and so forth. You know? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, you know, beware, coming to be like a thief. But if you read the rest of the chapter, it says, but for you, you know better. You have the, you have the information in front of you. It should not catch you like a thief. So it depends on whether or not you're, you've done your homework. It says that? It says that. Well, you know, even if you expect... At the same, same place? Well, or do you I'll show you. I'll sh just, let's just, no, let's just go there for a second, uh, since you raised a question about it. Isn't that what some people use for the rapture? Yeah, they use that yeah. scripture to suggest yeah. a, rap a rapture. Yeah. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1, and it did, didn't do what I wanted to do. Here, let's try again. There is no need to write you, brothers and sisters, about the times and occasions when these things will happen. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come as a thief comes at night. Right there, 1 Thessalonians 5. When people say everything is quiet and safe, then suddenly destruction will hit them. It will come as suddenly as the pains that come upon a woman in labor, and people will not escape, and so forth. You can, you can read down there 4 and 5. It all talks about it. But if you go down close to the end of this chapter... Um, when it says sudden destruction will come upon them, is that the plagues, mm -hmm. the, the last plagues? Yeah, presumably, yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, you could be expecting company to come to your house and mm -hmm. still be surprised when they come because you're busy doing something else and, and you're still surprised. So even if Jesus came for Adventists who, who think he's coming, they could still be surprised because... Mm -hmm. um, it just will happen yeah. when they don't expect it. Well, you know, the verse was far, farther up in the chapter than I thought. Verse 4, But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the darkness, and the day should not take you by surprise like a thief. All of you are people who belong to the light, who belong to the day. 
We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so then we should not be sleeping like the others. We should be awake and sober. So, right there, it shows the contrast. Now, now it doesn't really, you don't have to interpret that as, as the Lord coming right then. It's the, the, pro, the process of Him coming might The start. day of the Lord? What do you call that? Well, the day of the exactly. Lord, who knows? It could be a day of destruction. Mm -hmm. I think, I wonder whether it's got a broader uh, um, application. For some people in the world, their day is up. You've only got to look around the world at the trouble spots. We're kind of saying, well, we'll be here when he comes and already. Will we? There's tr going to be trouble everywhere. People are going to die whether they want it or not. I, th I think mm -hmm. it's got a broader spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I'm not negating what you read. I, I, I think that's very true. But you've only got to look in Syria and some of these places right now. Yeah. But Their day is over. Mm -hmm. It says that they'll be eating and drinking and marrying yeah. and giving in marriage. Uh, That's Matthew 24. They'll be doing their routine things, yeah. and all of a sudden, it's all over, and there's yeah. nothing they can do about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's like it's like before the flood. Yeah. Yeah. But but um, Ellen White speaks of the time was pretty grave back then too. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of murder. There was mm -hmm. they couldn't oh, yeah. think of anything but sin. That's right. Everything they did was sin. Which might be a little different than right at the moment. Oh, it could be a lot worse than, how, where, than we were thinking. Where would you go in the world that you might find someone who only thinks about sin? Well, there's a lot of people, but mm -hmm. what I'm thinking of is uh, it could go further than that. I mean, you haven't seen nothing yet. Maybe. You mean Maybe. like Las Vegas? Well, you, you know, I disagree. I think we're like boiled frogs. And I think we're in trouble right now. Mm -hmm. We don't realize how horrible our environment is with the morality. Uh, we're just boiled frogs. And they were probably saying in Noah's day, it's not really that bad. You mean gradually heated frogs? Yeah. yeah. And we're gradually, well, well, now we're boiling and don't even know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a friend who, who thinks that the economy's got to take off again so that everybody's making money, everybody's going like crazy, and that's that would be a good time when he'll come like a thief in the night. Nice. If, it, if it doesn't come during the time where, I mean, if the time is, is such that people are struggling and they're praying a lot, well, then it won't be the time that it'll come. So I, yeah. you know, there's well, all kinds of ways to look at this thing. Let, let, let me ask a question that maybe you haven't thought about before. Would you be comfor comfortable living in a world where only righteousness is practiced? Well, why not? Well, it's hard because there's a imagine. lot of people who aren't comfortable with that That's kind of a right. place. That's right. Yeah. Well, it's That's kind of why. theoretical, isn't it? Have That's you ever why. seen that? <laughs> no, I'm not, I didn't say anything about seeing it. I'm just saying there must, well, we believe there is a place like that. That's, that's what, where God lives. Adam and Eve were kicked out of it basically because they didn't comply. Yeah. Question is, what if I if I said, okay, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity right now. You will stop sinning forever. You have to give up all your favorite sins. You can live in a place with no sin. I think well, you that's know what we're all aiming for. It's a question of whether we we'll <laughs> really do it. You're you're very right because there are all sorts of groups. Like there's a song where they had to knock on the green door before uh, you could get in and they would see if you were okay, if you would be a participant in their sin and if you wouldn't, they would shut you out. So there are a lot of places like that where if you try to go, they don't want you there because um, they're all of one mind yeah. and doing something that uh, they don't want you to see. So that is going on it, now. Is a place like that, would it be rigid that it would be uncomfortable for everybody? That, that aren't that, righteous. That's why I'm, that's why I asked the question that's without right. giving the, the criteria. I when you say rigid, what does that mean? That means you go in and there's no grace for you anymore. I mean, if you grace do anything wrong, when you right. when you do something wrong, man, but there is you no could start burning wrong. up. That's huh? what gets you into heaven. That's what we're aiming for. I mean, you, you, by then you're supposed to be able to say, 
Yeah, but you implied that somebody may not be ready to go there because he's he's still a sinner and he, he still likes of course, to do not, some sin. None of us are sinners, right? Well, yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know what you mean. That's but but that's what you're saying, isn't it? Yeah. That here you are in dirty rags going to a, uh, a banquet where everybody has tuxedos. Yes. You're not ready to go in there yet. No. Is that what you're kind of yes, implying? Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you went to a party like that, if they would be okay for a while to have somebody yeah. come in with dirty robes. There's I mean, I'm kind of thinking about the thousand years there. Well, there's, there's a, a story, story in the Bible. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to the same place. <laughs> <laughs> there's a story in the Bible that says someone came in like that and he got thrown out. Without, the, In fact, the... In this case, it didn't matter what you were wearing outside. The the king, you were invited in. He said, I will supply robes to everybody. Yeah. And this person decided he didn't need that robe. He just went in in his dirty clothes. And the guy came around and said, friend, who, who let you in? Out you go. Which story is that? I'm trying to think. It's in Matthew yeah. uh, 20, 24, 25, somewhere in there getting a free robe, and that's what we do when we reject it. It's the yeah. story of the wedding feast. Yeah. yeah. Well, doesn't he... There are two different stories, so don't get them confused. Yeah, I'm getting them confused. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think, because there was one where a person gets a robe put around him, and, okay, you can come in. Yeah. And then... But the other one's sitting in amongst all that. the guests and, and refuses the robe. Hmm. Which one is that? Uh, hold on just a minute. I'll... See if we can get you there, taking a little bit of a detour from our... It might be, it might, I might know the story, but I never saw it that way. I've never seen it that way. Wouldn't that be the Pharisee that, uh, a, that told God that um, he was glad he was not like those other sinners? In other words, he did not need God's robe? Well, he didn't. There was no robe there. He just I know, but if there would have been, he would have thought he was good enough that he wouldn't have needed it. I think, I think the difference there is he didn't even see his lack anymore, whereas there will be people in the last times, the last moments of Earth's history will realize they had a chance that they threw away. Okay, it's in Matthew 22. Jesus was a, Once there was a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son, and of course the people didn't come and find... so. When it's all over, he says, now go to the main streets and invite the, to the feast as many people as you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, good and bad alike, and the wedding hall was filled with people. And that's really the end of that story. And that's where usually often where we stop. But the next paragraph says, the king went in to look at the guests and saw a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Yeah. Friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The king asked him. But the man said nothing. Then the king told the servants, tie him up hand and foot and throw him outside in the dark. There he will cry and grind his teeth. And Jesus concluded, many are invited, but few are chosen. Yeah. Wow. So that's the story. Was cool. that man offered a robe? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's pretty yeah. plain. I remember, I remember um, going out in the byways and bringing people in, but I guess maybe I've overlooked that last part. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, Christians have been looking forward to the second coming of Christ since the time he left almost 2,000 years ago. Events in the church and events in the world have often triggered speculation about Christ's return. Do we understand clearly why he hasn't come back? Ellen White stated that already in 1868, 1868, there had been long delay, and I quote, the long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason of so long delay. And when was that written? 1868. Testimonies, volume 2, page 194. It's also found in Evangelism, the book of Evangelism, page 694, second paragraph. Uh, Character there's, something, statement. Mm -hmm. there's something that I've always wondered about with that. Um, all those people that the Lord were was waiting for so they wouldn't be destroyed are dead. Yeah. So now they're okay? Yes. Maybe they got their chance. Okay, how would you died. explain that? Okay, I'll explain it like this. It's, it, it's 
it's fairly clear in my mind. We are in the middle of a great controversy. That's clearly spelled out in the writings of Ellen White. I believe it's clear in the Bible, but you, you need to have a sort of a clear picture of what it's all about before you go back and start looking for it, and then you find it there. Having said that, uh, one of the issues in the great controversy, Satan has always said, well, look, at almost everybody in this world is following my way. God, where are your people? And God says, just wait. They'll, 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 I'll have a people. And finally, at the end, at, at the time when theoretically we're furthest from, well, I mean, not just theoretically, we are is furthest from the tree of life, when theoretically the, the laws of heredity and so forth would, would mean our genetics is at its very worst, uh, God says, okay, I'm going to have a people, I'm going to work with these people, and they're going to be pure, and they're going to be so committed to my cause that nothing that Satan can do to them will cause them to give up. And the Bible calls those people the 144,000, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. And God is not going to let the world come to an end until there's a group of people. Uh, the 144,000 number doesn't mean anything. It's a symbolic number. But until there's this group of people who absolutely will stand firm no matter what the devil does to them, and the devil will, will, will try to kill them if he, could, if he could, they will not give in, they will not agree to... When, when Revelation 13 says the whole world will wander after the beast. The whole world will wander after the beast, except for those whose names are written. So there will be a lot of, millions and millions of people who will be saved who, who couldn't have stood up under that kind of pressure. But they're savable people. But God, at the end, has to have that special group of people who are not going to just be savable. They're going to be so committed to the truth, so committed to God's cause, that nothing the devil could do would, will, 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 will cause them to be defeated. So what did they do that, what's happening now that's different than all the millennium of the past that God's going to do that's different? There's, not that God's going to do this different. He, the people are going to say, a group of people are going to say, I, I'm absolutely committed to this truth, the truth about God, and I know God, I understand Him, I love Him, and nothing the devil can say or do will confuse me or, and convince me that He is God, because the whole world is going to believe that the devil is God. Christ Object Lessons puts it, on the same topic, yeah. but a little differently. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come to claim them as his own. How's your character stacking up? You know, that's well, a, yeah, you just made the question. I'm just wondering if he'll ever come, if you're going to take that kind of a tack. Yeah, I think so, because uh, there's another statement that will help clarify that, and that's in Great Controversy, page 48. He does not forget or neglect his children, but he permits the wicked to reveal their true character, that none uh, who desire to do his will may be deceived concerning them. Again, the righteous are placed in the furnace of affliction, that they themselves may be purified, that their example may convince others of the reality of faith and godliness, and also that their consistent course may condemn the ungodly and unbelieving. There, there's going to be a separation on the basis of character, and the character of God's people is going to make the unrighteous uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there'll be a division. And there'll be persecution by the masses on the, on the few who want to do this. But that, per, that perfects their character. And that's what's different than in the last 2,000 years. Well, how about by the fall of Jerusalem when there was tons of people being put through all kinds of fire right then? Yeah. Why? And some, some lived through it and, and faithfully. And some of them left. Well, why didn't he come right then? If that because was not right? enough. Yeah. And it wasn't. It wasn't worldwide. So can, you need a you need a certain number. Mm -hmm. you uh, need can, a, can you give an example? Um, 
of what a 144,000 person might look like from uh, examples in the Old Bible? Would it be a 144,000 John the Baptist, uh, Apostle John, Paul, Jeremiah? What? Jesus. It'll, it'll be that whose character is perfectly well, looking, reproduced. So it would be a Jesus-like. Yeah. There is no human. So is there anyone in the Old Testament that lives up to this um, Well, Daniel criteria? probably came close. Daniel. Enoch okay. did. Enoch. 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 Okay. Moses. Moses, okay. Yeah. And, and they were still flawed a bit. Yeah. But Daniel didn't seem to be very flawed at all. But let me read some more verses. Recorded. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> let me read some more verses because I want to make it very clear that God spells this out. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. This is Second Peter three. I'm going to start. I'm going to read from verses ten to thirteen. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Now here's our day of the Lord coming like a thief again. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. This is not a, well, maybe maybe it was a rapture. No, no. The, di the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed. And the earth with everything in it will vanish. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will melt by, be melted by the heat. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. And if you go back to Ellen White to read another passage, um, look at this one. The angels of God in their messages to, me, I'm sorry, to men represent time as very short. And you can, you can look at that. Go back to Joel. Joel wrote 700 plus years before Christ. And he said, the day of the Lord is here. It's very near. You know, what are you going to do? And of course, there were plagues happening at that point in time. And so that was his reason for saying the day of the Lord is near. But and then there are other people in the Old Testament, lots of people in the New Testament. J John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 says, uh, you know, it's, it's here now. You know, the end. The end is here. Well, going on. It is true that time has continued longer than we expected in the early days of this message. Our Savior did not appear as soon as we hoped. But has the word of the Lord failed? Never, she says. It should be remembered that the promises and the threatenings of God are alike conditional. What does that mean? We have to do our part. Yeah. It, it's the if. If you do this, that will happen. If you don't, that will happen. Yeah. I like the Message Bible in that area. It says, God isn't late with His promises, some measure lateness. He is restraining Himself on account of you, holding back the end because He doesn't want anyone else lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. Yeah. Well, He did the same thing with the children of Israel when they were going into the Promised Land. Mm -hmm. Moses told them at the end of Deuteronomy, yeah. this is what you could have. Mm -hmm. This is Good. probably what you will do. But this is what you could have if you'll yep. just follow. Yep. And in the face of that, we're repeating their history. Yeah. Yep. So when does it stop? Well, listen to the rest of this. God had committed to his people a work to be accomplished on earth. The third angel's message was to be given. The minds of believers were to be directed to the heavenly sanctuary where Christ had entered to make atonement for his people. If you ask the average Adventist. What is Jesus doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary? What would they tell you? They'd probably argue about the sanctuary. <laughs> He's yeah. pleading for our case. Yeah, that would probably be what would be said by most. The Sabbath reform was to be carried forward. The breach in the law of God must be made up. The message must be proclaimed with a loud voice that all the inhabitants of earth might receive the warning. The people of God must uh, purify their souls through obedience to the truth and be prepared to stand without fault. There's your yeah. perfectly reproduced. Stand without fault before him at his coming. Had Adventists, after the great disappointment of eight, in 18, 1844. Now, the word is capitalized here. However, who is she talking about? Is she talking about Seventh-day Adventists? 
No, they hadn't come along yet. Seventh-day Adventist hadn't come along until 1863, almost mm -hmm. 20 years later. So had Adventists, this is that group of people that prepared for the Second Coming in 1844, held fast their faith and followed on unitedly in the opening providence of God, receiving the message of the third angel, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming it to the world, they would have seen the salvation of God, the Lord would have wrought mightily with their deeds, the work would have been completed, and Christ would have come ere this to receive his people to the reward. When she says ere this, what does she say? What is she meaning? Before this. Before this, right. But in the period of doubt and uncertainty that followed the disappointment, many of the Advent believers yielded their faith. Dissensions and divisions came in. The majority opposed with voice and pen the few who, following in the providence of God, received the Sabbath reform and began to proclaim the third angel's message. Mm -hmm. Many who should have devoted their time and talents to the one purpose of sounding warning to the world were absorbed in opposing the Sabbath truth and in turn the labor of its advocates was necessarily spent in answering their, these opponents and defending the truth. Thus the work was hindered and the world was left in darkness. Had the whole Adventist body united upon the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, how widely different would have been our history. You know, so, the, the disappointment was a pretty hard thing to take. Mm -hmm. That was a lot. I mean, that was a, that flattened a lot of people. I, I can understand it, actually. I mean, if she's talking about time after that disappointment, they should have just came together and held on to faith. Um, you can't really look at them you can't blame them too much for for what's happened because that was a very, very, very shaken thing not to show up at the well, right time. And you don't think that that's going to happen again, even worse at the very end? Are you Have suggesting you that that was a temptation stronger than they could bear? No, I'm just saying that I can understand why they wouldn't yeah. hold on because it's, it's, I mean, look at it, 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 it would, Look at the Bible, all the prophecies, they all added up to that time and nothing happened. I mean, it just went by. There was nothing. I think and so, what do you expect? I think the devil got in there a little bit here yeah. and there too, because this affected all the major churches that were here. Yeah. And there were people in high places didn't like their, losing their sheep. You mean, you mean the devil kept God from coming on no, no, 1844? No. Assisting in all these divisions. There's yeah. a lot of That's stuff going on historically right there that you don't see much about, but it was there going on. But, uh, you know, I can just see, I, I mean, can just see what the, what the pressures were yeah, after uh, that happened. It would be a shock, no question. It, well, I think, I think the whole thing, what it did, what it ended up doing was um, breaking the paradigms. Mm -hmm. I mean, people had to go back and said, okay, folks, we did something wrong, what is it? And when they did that, they threw out everything to reconstruct it again. That's when they came up with the Sabbath. That's when they started coming up with the great controversy after that. And if, if all that hadn't happened, if they hadn't did a mind reset, I don't think, I don't think the Sabbath truth would have came out. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what she says. It was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be thus delayed. God did not design that his people, Israel, should wander 40 years in the wilderness. What about that story? He promised to lead them directly to the land of Canaan. It was about a two-week walk from, from Egypt to Canaan, if you go by the most direct route, and established them there a holy, healthy, happy people. But those to whom it was first preached went not in because of unbelief. Their hearts were filled with murmuring, rebellion, and hatred, and he could not fulfill his covenant with them. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. What were those sins? Unbelief, murmuring, murmuring complaining, complaining, rebellion. rebellion. Okay? In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief the worldliness, unconsecration, 
and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Written 1883. Evangelism 695 to 696, Maranatha 61 and 62, and Selected Messages, Volume 1, Book 1, 67, 68, and other places. Now, in in uh, describing the people who did 40 years later go into the Promised Land, were they described as a better people, no. not murmuring, not doing this? The old ones died off. It was another generation that went in. You read Revelation, the description of the Laodicean church. Blind, naked, miserable, wretched. And you say, that's our church. And you look around and say, well, who, who are the blind, miserable, wretched ones? I mean, where are we're doing, they? We're doing just fine. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we, we're kidding ourselves. We, we, we don't understand our wretchedness. And that's what they were having a problem with. Well, you know the, fa the famous verses. Uh, we've, we've talked about these many times. John 14, for example, verses 1 to 3. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my Father's house, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. You know the way that leads to the place where I'm going and so forth, the conversation went on. So Jesus has clearly promised that he's gone to prepare a place for us. And I, I mean, if Jesus promised that, I, I'm ready to say he's going to do it. Yep. Well, furthermore, he says that the, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He says that in a number of places. Mm -hmm. What is Alpha? Where did the term Alpha and Omega come from? Greek. Greek what? The beginning and the end. The b first letter of the alphabet and the last letter in the alphabet, yeah. Uh, we translate that as the beginning and the end. It's used in several places in Revelation 1 and 21 and 22. What does that mean to be the beginning and the end? Well, that's what we want to talk about. What do you think it means? Well, I can understand he was the beginning. He, Jesus was there. He was God when nothing else was. But what does it mean to be the end? There's nothing better. It's reached the pinnacle. He is what we're striving for. But omega just means the end. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, surely it means at least this much that whenever this world comes to an end, he's going to be there. That's right. mm. It means at least that much. I was yeah. there in the beginning and I'll be there after yep. everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of another way of saying encompassing. Yeah. Uh, encompass everything. There is nothing better. When you look at yeah. the ads for Omega watches, that's what they're getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Peter tells us that the wickedness at the end will be like it was in Noah's day. You know what happened then. People will question creation. They will question the flood. Do we hear any of that kind of stuff today? But this will only demonstrate that they are a part of the signs of the end. You remember the, the verses there. It says, you know, look especially there. Um, for first of all, you must understand, this is 2 Peter 3, verse 3. First of all, you must understand that in these last days, some people appear whose lives are controlled by their own lusts. They will mock you and will ask, He promised to come, didn't He? Where is He? Our ancestors have already died, but everything is still the same as it was since the creation of the world. They purposely ignore the fact that long ago, God gave a command and the heavens and earth were created. The earth was formed out of water and by water, and it was also by water, waters of the flood, that the old world was destroyed. So Sounds there, familiar, doesn't it? So there is a talk about in the end, they will give up on creation mm -hmm. and they'll give up on the flood. Yep. Any of that going on? Lots and lots of it. Most of the world. Predicted. Right there. So what you say to someone like that when they tell you that is, wow, you're the latest sign I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they don't like it very well, so you have to be careful how you say it. In Noah's day, they did not have any written Bible. No. Correct? So these were... Um, God's word came to them through prophets, through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, how many years they lived? 
nine hundred yeah. plus years. Well, you have time to to memorize a few oh, things. <laughs> maybe they knew Adam or sure. his children. Okay. Yeah. Very possible. Do we have anything? I've never seen anything statistically. Have we got any idea what the population may have been? What I'm getting at is now we must have a much greater population than yeah. we ever had. But there were a lot of people on the earth yeah. in those days. We, we don't know for sure how many, but there are apparently a lot. Well, why do you suppose that some Christians are now suggesting that the sem second coming will only be a kind of change in the way things happen here on this earth? Is the second coming going to be a literal return of Jesus Christ or rather some kind of do-it-yourself transformation of human beings here on this earth? No, I think it's for real. Well, they kind of, some of these theories are kind of naturalistic. You know, you yes. kind of have naturalism Very much so. explained, you know, about creation. And then you've got a kind of a naturalism form, you know, of, of the second coming, too. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, these these secret raptures and whatever is, is what people want, but not necessarily the facts. Right. Can you think of a time when people tried to sort of do it themselves and solve all the problems and take care of their own futures, etc.? Tower of Babel? The Tower of Babel is a perfect example. That's exactly. They wanted to find out what that, where that water came from, and they <laughs> wanted to make sure it wasn't going to happen again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, the second coming is mentioned or hinted at many times in the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, there are some prophecies pointing all the way to the second coming of Christ. Take, for example, Daniel 2, verse 44. Mm -hmm. At that time, remember, this is at the end of the prophecy where there was that great metal image and there was the gold and the silver and the bronze and the, and the f legs and feet of iron and uh, legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. Uh, at the time of those rulers, the God of heaven will establish a king that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. That's pretty definitive terms. I don't know how you can sort of argue with that unless you're just going to call the Bible a flat-out liar. Well, try to imagine a world without sin, sickness, death, fear, violence, hatred, poverty, crime, war, or suffering. Anybody missed any of those things? No. Well, some of us would be out of a job. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. But why would anyone really oppose that kind of an idea? No. Nobody. But those things really don't bring happiness either. Well, you mean sin, sickness, death, fear, violence, hatred, poverty, well, crime, war? Of, if you got rid of all those. Don't you think the people who are dying of cancer would be happy if you got rid of their cancer? I know a lot of people that are in perfect good health and they're bored and depressed. Oh, yeah. Well, that's possible, too. Because they don't know what life is about. Mm -hmm. well, what is it that they haven't discovered about life? What they haven't? They have obviously you know, they have not discovered something. They're unhappy. Well, do you have an answer for that? I think so. I think they haven't found out the joy of serving others. Mm -hmm. When they yeah. find that joy and they have that in their heart, they can walk right into heaven and be perfectly at peace. Mm -hmm. I know, I know <laughs> I know you I know you, you think you know what you're saying. I think I know what you're saying. Um, but it's true. When, it's true. When you have okay. a package of me, myself, and I, it does get very boring. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you something about my personal experience. I work in a clinic connected to Loma Linda University. And... We have had people come and go in that clinic who have a lot of selfish ambitions. And they never last very long. We take care of poor people who don't have insurance and so forth like this. And they're not always pleasant people to deal with. They've had a really, many of them have had, have had really rough lives. And, and uh, they're not sure when they come into the clinic, they have all kinds of problems. But they're not sure that you're going to be nice to them at all. Sometimes they'll be standing at the front desk and they're already shouting and cussing and carrying on, you know, 
and we have to, to come out and say, hold on, just a minute, calm down, we're here to help you. But the people who, who stay at the clinic are people who believe that they have a mission to accomplish, that they have something to, to do there that, that really matters, that they, and they care about reaching out to people who, who need help. And as a result, we have a wonderful kind of family atmosphere. People come in there. There are people who come and visit us on a regular basis. I'm sure they don't need to come and see us at all. They just come. We're the, we're the best thing in their lives. The atmosphere that they feel there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, our Christian friends who believe that people go to the reward in heaven or hell immediately upon death have a different view of what's implied by the second coming of Christ. But for us who take the biblical approach and believe that the dead are sleeping, awaiting a literal coming of Christ, it becomes a very pivotal event. Where would you go in the Bible just to find out that, uh, that death is nothing more than a sleep? The New Testament, Christ said as much. It well, he was really talking about Lazarus. Yeah. Okay, that would be John 11. Does the Ecclesiastes, doesn't it say something? Yeah, it's, it says something like that there. Um, well, look at John 11. I'm going to start with verse 11. Jesus said, well, he's been talking to the disciples. So Jesus said this and then added, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, If he's asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. But for your sake, I'm glad that I was not with him, so that you will believe. Let us go to him. And, of course, you know what happened. Jesus went there, and he didn't sleep very long, did he? Nope. He called him forth from the tomb. Yeah. Well, if God has no plans to come back again, what was the point of his coming the first time? I mean, seriously. Mm -hmm. Why bother? No point if, if God is just going to let us live lives here and die off and be dead a long time, and that's all he ever planned, why bother to come the first time? You know, this world is so enthralled with science that it can't imagine anymore a God who can't be proven in a laboratory in a second coming in a worldwide flood, in creation. So they just um, don't believe it can happen. It's not going to happen. I don't think science is what's doing that, though. You don't think so? No, because I know a lot of scientists that, that God is very real to them. So I, I wouldn't say that science is the, the culprit. Well, science so-called is the I culprit. I think there are probably more that are trying to exclude. I them. haven't met it's many scientists. Oh. There was a study done. And My brother's a scientist. And 40% of the practicing scientists believe in a in a in a god and the definition of god that was used in the survey is one that you can pray to and expect an answer hmm. 40 percent of the scientists but you won't get them to say that in their papers <laughs> of course <laughs> lose tenure <laughs> well right. jesus came and dealt with sin romans 8 3 and other places first corinthians 15 and answered the questions in the great controversy so he did what he was sent to do in that first time. He rose from death. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 suggests that his rising from the dead is our guarantee of the future life. Maybe we should just look, look at that. People might not be sure they understand that. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. What, what are they doing right now? Sleeping in death. Sleeping in death, yeah. right? And what's going to happen to them? They're going to wake up. They're, They're going to be raised. Rise first. Exactly. So, Matthew 20, verses 20, verse 28 says, Like the Son of Man who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life to redeem many people. Notice that word, redeem. What, what does the word redeem mean? Pay for. Okay. Get really get something back, get back that used to belong to you. Right. Yeah, Maybe you it. took it to a pawn shop or oh, you sold yeah, it to yeah. somebody and now you want to get it back, right? Yeah. What would be the point of Christ redeeming his people 
and then not bothering to come picking them up, get them back again. Useless. Or if they went up there automatically. Yeah. As soon, yeah. as, they, as, soon as they go to he death here. It was a waste of his effort. It was a total waste. Yeah. Well, if someone pays a ransom to get something back, does it make any sense that they never come to claim that right of possession? In light of all this, the greatest promise that Christ will come back again is the fact that he came and did what he did the first time. People have been waiting for the first coming and then the second coming right through biblical history. Hebrews 11 tells the story of many people who have waited. Abraham waited for his son. You remember how long? 100 years. Israel waited for Egyptian deliverance. Or deliverance from Egypt would maybe be more precise. The prophets waited for Christ's first coming. The disciples waited for his second coming after he left the first time. So why the delay? Do we have anywhere to look except to ourselves? No. Christ said repeatedly that he would come back. In fact, he said, Revelation 3, 11, 22, 7, and 12, and 20, Behold, I come quickly. Has he come quickly? Would you say 2,000 years later he's come quickly? On his time frame, yes. Yeah. On That's our time, kind of a cop out. On, on our time, no, it's not. He's dealing with, he's dealing with eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's so, talking to you that only lives about 70 years. Yeah. That's right. But in that 70 years, he gives me the opportunity to hook up with him and get the eternity. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're putting a lot into what he's just saying there. Yeah. Well, you know, for me, the fact that he says he's coming back s doesn't make me believe it as much as when you study the Bible and look at the prophecies and you see how mm -hmm. correct they were and you're going well if they were correct then and it shows when about he's going to be coming back and to me that makes it more real mm -hmm. but just to read that I'm coming back I think um, you know I um, when I had my first son Eric you know, I was at the church there. I carried him upstairs where they do the videotaping. And um, and the videotape guy, I know him very, very well. He's an older guy. And he says, he says, you remember your time here because he's going to grow up very quickly. You know, and he's going to be gone. I looked at him and I said, sure. You know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and mm -hmm. it just doesn't seem like it. But oh, sure enough, yeah. Eric's grown up, he's gone, and it was very quickly. Mm. It was very quickly. I think that's what's going to happen when he finally comes, because you're going to still think that, well, it was pretty quick. It wasn't as long as I imagined it, mm -hmm. or it felt like. It's a good example. Well, of course, each one of us, I mean, to support Norm's point, eventually, it if, if time lasts long enough, each one of us is going to have a second coming kind of experience because we're going to die. And then the next thing we know, he's going to be back. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So those of us who are still alive at the end, how long, the question of how long is a troubling one. Look at Revelation 6, 9 to uh, 11. Then the Lamb broke open the fifth seal. I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been killed because they had proclaimed God's word and had been faithful in their witnessing. They shouted in a loud voice, Almighty Lord, holy and true, how long will it be until you judge the people on earth and punish them for killing us? Each of them was given a white robe and they were told to rest a little while longer until the, com until the complete number of their fellow servants and fellow Christians had been killed as they had been. You know, it kind of bothers me, though, when they say, and punish them for killing us. Uh, we're supposed to turn yeah. the other cheek. And it sounds vengeful. And they're already in a good place, so what do they care anymore? Isn't that figurative? I think very you figurative. You realize that too oh. far, you're going to have people going to heaven when they die, and I don't think it's that way around, unless like Enoch and some of those folks. Oh. Well, there's some places that talk about the final events. One is parables and things. One is found in Luke 12. 
I'm going to read you 40, verses 42 to 48. The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise servant? He is the one that his master will put in charge to run the household and give the other servants their share of the food at the proper time. How happy is that that servant is if his master finds him doing this when he comes home. Indeed, I tell you, the master will put that servant in charge of all his property. But if that servant says to himself that his master is taking a long time to come back, and if he begins to beat the other servants, and both, both men and women, and eats and drinks and gets drunk, then the master will come back one day when the servant does not expect him, and at a time he does not know. The master will cut him in pieces and make him share the fate of the disobedient. The servant who knows what his master wants him to do, but does not get himself ready and do it, will be punished with the heavy whipping. But the servant who does not know what his master wants, and yet does something for which he deserves a whipping, will be punished with a light whipping. Much is required from the person to whom much is given, much more is required from the person to whom much more is given. That doesn't scare you. Yeah. Well, isn't that the way we train our kids? I mean, with the whippings and... The well, you know, and the trick is, though, to be doing what the Master wants you to do because you love doing it mm -hmm. and let Him change your heart so that you wouldn't want to even do anything else. Yeah. Well, are Advents becoming very, way too comfortable in this world? Are we gradually becoming more and more like the world around us? Remember the Great Controversy, page 555, where it talks about that famous rule that by beholding we become changed. We're changed intellectually and spiritually by the things we look at, the things we think about, the things we hear. So we will gradually become like what we worship and admire and fill our minds with. Evolutionists and scientists are predicting that our universe, even our, or our solar system, depending on if you want to limit it somewhat, will eventually decay and collapse back in on itself. As Christians, and especially as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we know that that will not be the end of this world. So if the evolutionists and scientists are so wrong about the future of our universe, why would we believe what to say about the origins of our universe? <laughs> Fair question, right? Yeah. If we doubt the return of Jesus Christ, we are in effect calling Jesus himself a liar. So, could the second coming be nothing more than a scattering of raptures for those who are faithful to God, leaving the rest of us behind? How do we keep our focus on what is most important? Our lives are filled full of the urgent, so that we very often forget the important. Mm, that's true. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, his disciples were deeply depressed. They thought the world had, in effect, come to an end. But when he rose from the dead, and they realized the truth about who he was, that he was God, they went out and threw their lives into ministry. They were not even afraid of death. They dedicated their full time to spreading the gospel and turned the world upside down in one generation, not even a, like a half a generation. What about us? What percentage of our time do we spend witnessing about our beliefs? If Christ called you today to step out and witness for him full time, promising that he would care for you, would you be ready to go? What do you think? Mm -hmm. What things in your life as it is today keep you back from spending more time in Bible study, prayer, and witnessing? Do we actually need to be so engaged and consumed by jobs, mortgages, education, and retirement that we have no time to do God's work? It was described as the cares of this life. Yeah. I'll say this carefully, but church leadership is getting away from witnessing because they really don't consider that we have a message to give to other Christians or to anyone else and and so in the leadership it is discouraged a lot and so then the flock follows the re leadership and then you have stray people in the flock who want to witness and and they're kind of um, not encouraged or even mm -hmm. discouraged so I mean it's other than just us 
um, the system has gotten away from witnessing. If Jesus were coming, came back today, would he be able to find disciples like the 12 that he, at least like the 11 that he found? I suspect so. In New Testament time? I think so. I think it could be. Daniel 12 has... There's got to be very many of them. Okay. Daniel 12, verse 3 has an interesting comment. The wise leaders, it's talking about the end of this earth's history. The wise leaders will shine with all the brightness of the sky, and those who have taught many people to do what is right, what is that talking about? Evangelism. It's talking about sharing. Yeah, it's yeah, talking about sharing. evangelism, whatever you're witnessing, whatever you want to call it. Those who have taught many people to do what is right will shine like the stars forever. So it says specifically there, the people who are going to heaven, the ones, some of them anyway, a lot of them are going to be people who have witnessed. Okay? How many of us are ready for that kind of experience? Are we living like we really believe that Jesus is coming soon? You remember Matthew 28, 16 to 20. It's spelled out very clearly there. Adventists have been proclaiming the soon coming of Christ since the days of William Miller in the 1830s. 18, the end of 1820s, 1830s, early 1840s. What lessons did we learn from the great disappointment of 1844? If someone asks you about 1844, can you give a cogent, intelligent, rational explanation about what happened and why it happened and how we can avoid it happening again? Well, Christians believe that the two most important events in the history of our world are his first coming and his second coming. What are we doing to make that belief a living reality in our own lives and the lives of those around us? Thought about, I, do we just sort of live our lives saying, well, someday somebody's going to do something and it's going to be all over? Or are we seriously figuring out how we can be a part of bringing the end? That's what we should be doing. That's right. And at the end of this series of lessons, I would like to challenge you, as I've challenged our friends here at the table to, today, to think about what you're doing. Are you, do, are you going to be a part of the solution or part of the problem? Yeah. You can choose to be a, a true disciple of Jesus Christ in the 21st century, just as they were way long ago in the 1st century. And Jesus will come again. You can count on it. And he could come again in our day. Let's hope it happens. See you next week.